Hello, New Hope and friends beyond. Great to be able to share with you today. I am in the beautiful Yulestead Chapel, one of my favorite rooms in our facilities at New Hope Assembly. Uh, I'm the only one in this room except for Joel Pruitt, who's helping us today with uh, audio and video and appreciate his help so very, very much. By the way, Joel is uh, exceptionally handsome. He's fabulously wealthy because he's employed here at New Hope and he is single. So I'll leave the rest up to you. Well, uh, I know you've heard uh, there's a virus going around and I hoping, hope you're coping well with that. Uh, several weeks ago, I saw a cartoon and uh, in the first frame, a lady was, was knitting something. And in the second frame, it was revealed that she was actually knitting a hangman's noose for her husband. So I hope, hope you're doing a lot better than that. You're not at that point. I hope that grace is reigning in your hearts and in your homes. Uh, these are unique days, uh, particularly challenging days like we could not have imagined. And here we are right in the midst of it. I want to talk to you for just a few minutes today on the theme, When Saints Suffer. And would like to look to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Peter, writing to fellow believers, says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though some strange thing were happening to you. But rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. And then the last verse of that chapter, 1 Peter chapter 4, So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful Creator and continue to do good. Suffering, it happens to one and all, Suffering comes in different degrees and dimensions, but suffering to some degree and in some dimension is something we will all face. Loss, heartache, disappointment, troubles, burdens, grief will eventually come calling. So the question is, how do we handle them? And what will carry us through? Well, we need more than mind games and fragile philosophies and feel-good gimmicks to get through the hard times. We need more than empty cliches and religious recitations. We need God-given, God-revealed truth and an unequivocal, unwavering trust in that, the God who has given us that truth. And that's what you will find in the apostles, Paul, James, John, Jude, and yes, Simon Peter. And here's just some of what he says to suffering saints. First of all, he says, don't be surprised in your suffering. Now, if you listen to some preachers, you would think that we're all supposed to live a charmed life, that believers somehow have been given an exemption, an immunity, against the very things that Peter is writing about, pain, grief, trials, suffering, his words. Well, Peter gives us a reality check, and he says, don't be surprised when suffering pays you a visit. Now, take a moment with me just to consider the people to whom Peter was writing, and consider their circumstances. Go no further than the first verse of 1 Peter. We read Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ to God's elect, exiles scattered throughout the provinces of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. They were scattered, scattered because of persecution, because of a hostile ruler who wanted them dead. Nero was his name. Nero was known for his ruthless tyranny and his unrestrained extravagance. 
He was everything ugly, violent, and paranoid, and deceptive, and murderous. Historian Philip Schaff calls him a monster of iniquity, a demon in human shape. He could kill at a whim and enjoy it. He had the power to do it, and he did it. He murdered his mother, his wives, his brothers, and his teacher. He is the one who will have the Apostle Paul beheaded and Simon Peter crucified. He even tried to murder himself, commit suicide, but he lost his nerve and he had his associate do it for him at the age of 32. Nero, known for his Colosseums and crucifixions, targeted Christians as scapegoats for everything that went wrong in his, in his empire, just like Hitler did and his targeting of the Jews. After all, these Christians were not calling Caesar Lord like Nero had dictated. They would only call Jesus Lord. And Nero considered them disloyal to Rome and more importantly, disloyal to him. So there was a monstrous outbreak of persecution against the church from a sick and sadistic Nero. This was the cultural setting of the believers to whom Peter was writing. This is our legacy. And yet many were surprised when they experienced suffering in this life because they're not biblically informed. They're more in touch with TV theology than they are with the apostles of Christ. There is no contradiction in the teachings of God's Word and sufferings in the believer's life. Peter says in verse 12, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the pain, the trial, the suffering, as though some strange thing were happening to you. You are not an exception to the rule. You are the rule. You are not an anomaly. You are the norm. It's not strange when you go through trials. It would be strange if you didn't. Have you ever thought about what our lives would be like if we never suffered, if we never went through a battle, if we never faced a test? Well, we would be weak, untested, and unproven. Our strength, our capacity, our courage, even our faith would be a mystery even to us. There would be an abundance of lessons we would never learn. We would forfeit one of God's means to teach us and strengthen us. There would be a lack of compassion for others who go through trials and tests. Don't be surprised in your suffering. The second thing Peter tells us is to rejoice in our suffering. In verse 13, he said, but rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. Rejoicing in suffering is not a normal thing unless you know Jesus, and Jesus makes a new normal possible. We don't rejoice because we are suffering. We don't rejoice because of that, but we rejoice in our suffering. We rejoice despite our suffering. And in the Christian's life, there is that capacity that joy overrules fear and self-pity and doubt and discouragement. The capacity to carry on with joy through times of suffering is the reality of spiritually and scripturally enlightened men and women. They know some things that enable them to face life struggles and hardships with faith and hope and power and, yes, even joy. Peter tells us we can rejoice in our sufferings because, number one, he says, we, we participate in the sufferings of Christ. Uh, he has suffered before us. We do not suffer in any way that Christ has not al already suffered and in a way that Christ already understands. 
And if you are, are alone during this uh, virus, epidemic, pandemic, if you feel terribly alone, just think of Christ dying on a cross. What could be more lonely than dying on a cross in front of a mocking crowd? If you're facing an enemy, he has faced a thousand more, a thousand times more ferocious. If you are in a place of agony, look to him. He's been there, spat upon, slapped, beaten, rejected by enemies and forsaken by friends. If you feel abandoned by God, he too knows just how that feels. And he bore that very pain from the cross. You and I have a friend in Jesus, a companion in suffering. We have one who understands. Additionally, Peter says we can rejoice in our sufferings because even in our suffering, he says, we are blessed. In verse 14, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rest upon you. So when others curse you, God is there to bless you. And when others ha may have a spirit of gloom, you can have a spirit of glory that rests upon you. So he says in verse 16, do not be ashamed. Do not be ashamed. No need to walk around with your head so low your shoes have an extra tongue. No need to be so ashamed that you uh, walk around thinking that God has forsaken you and that your life is insignificant. Oh, how could we when His blessing is upon us? We are blessed even in our suffering. Peter speaks of suffering according to God's will in verse 19. That's right, there's no dichotomy or discrepancy in suffering and being in God's will. Suffering doesn't mean you are not in God's will or that you have been excluded from God's blessing. In fact, suffering may very well be God's chosen path for His people. But remember this, suffering will give way to glory. Peter speaks of joy now and being overjoyed when His glory is revealed. So I want to encourage you today, Always look past your suffering. Your suffering is not the final chapter. Suffering will give way to glory. Not a temporary, shallow, earthly, vain glory. No, the glory of God, an eternal weight of glory. So don't be surprised in your suffering. Secondly, rejoice in your suffering. And thirdly, commit and continue in your suffering. That's exactly the way he ends this chapter. So then those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Sometimes the most courageous act you can take and the most heroic statement you can make is just to continue that's right, keep on keeping on. Commit to the will of God. Continue to do the will of God. I'm going to run to the finish line. And if I can't run, I'm going to walk. And if I can't walk, I'm going to crawl. And if I can't crawl, I'm going to ask somebody to carry me. But I'm going through. There is no turning back, and there is no giving up. We're going through. I know my God will help me. When I am weak, He will make me strong. When I am afraid, He will give me courage. I will trust in Him because He is trustworthy. And I will be faithful because He is faithful. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you that there's not a day or a destiny in which we are alone, for you have promised to never leave us nor forsake us. 
And we're thankful, Lord, that even though we may be separated, we are never separated from you. Uh, nothing can separate us from the love of God. Nothing in life, not even death itself. We're thankful, Lord, that we have the promise of your eternal presence in our hearts. And I pray today that you will lift us up and release within us a new capacity for faith and peace and joy. We thank you today for the promises, all of which have been made, yea and amen, through Christ Jesus. So help us today, Lord, to be good receivers. And in our receiving, we know that we will be blessed by your mighty hand. We thank you in Jesus' name.